What is up guys, it's Arnek and welcome back. This week I will show you how you can create your own motion graphic templates, which you then can use in Premiere Pro for example, to quickly add custom animations and spice up your videos. But enough with the talk, let's get to it. Roll the intro. That's so stupid. Okay guys, bear with me, this is gonna be a long one. The animation I prepared for this tutorial is actually the one you saw in the introduction, and one I plan to use in my future videos as well. As this tutorial is not about how to create the animation per se, I will skip the detailed explanation of the setup. However, if you want me to break down the animation of this particular setup, let me know in the comments. To make it easier for us to navigate through the timeline, I already shied away all the elements we don't need to work on. Okay, with all that out of the way, let's dive into the necessary settings. So basically what makes this whole setup kind of complicated is that we want everything to automatically adjust to whatever text is entered into the main text layer. So let's see what happens when we turn subscribe to something like like and subscribe. After all, we want to be able to change the text later on. That's the whole purpose of the templates, right? There are a few things you notice right away. First thing is that the leading line already is following the text as we want it. However, elements like the squares and the bell are still stuck in place. But I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, let's take a few steps back. Regarding the leading line, obviously the automatic size adjustments don't just happen out of nowhere. I already typed the necessary expressions for this layer to function the way it is. But I will not go through all of this in depth as, again, that is not really the purpose of this tutorial. But to give you a rough idea, I pinpoint the shape's anchor point to its right edge with the expression you see here. Then I lock the layer in place so it will always stay with the first part of the line, in case we ever want to change its angle or something. And the last expression I used is for the size. I will add the expression in the description for you to take a look at. Just note that you will have to work with a rectangle for this to work. It does not function with a simple path, as the expression needs pixel values to calculate correctly. If you want more in-depth explanations of this specific expression, or expressions in general and how they work together, let me know in the comments. Because expressions are kind of a rabbit hole to dive into if you really want to make the most of it. Okay, so now let's get back to the tutorial and extend the text layer. If we zoom in, we can find our squares sitting out of place. To change that, we have to create a new null object. By right-clicking, go to New and choose Null Object. First of all, I like to keep my timeline sorted, so I changed the null's label color to purple. It's just a habit I got into, which makes it easier for me to find it once I go back to the project later on. Next, I will position the null right on top of the squares. Simply highlight all the squares and parent them to the null object using the pick width. Since we know that we are only going to work with the horizontal position of the null object, we can separate its position values. Just right click position and choose separate dimensions. With the X and Y values for position separated, let's think about how we want the squares to be positioned. In order to make sure that the null object has its fixed position on the left side of the text, we have to add the width of the text layer to the gap between the text and the right edge of our composition. We achieve that by taking whatever width your composition has and subtract the gap between the composition's edge and the text layer. That probably sounded more complicated than it actually is. Simply take the composition width minus the gap minus the text width. For that, simply hit Ctrl or Command plus R to bring up the rulers and pull in the guideline. Zoom in a little and see where it's at. So in our case, we're roughly at 1690 pixel, which gives us a gap of 230 pixels, right? So let's add the expression by Alt or Option clicking the stopwatch on X position of our null and type the following. Take whatever width your composition has, so in our case it's 1920 minus the gap, 230, and from that we need to subtract the text layer's width. To do so, simply pick with the text layer, and here is where it gets tricky. This itself will not give us the result we are looking for. We have to add a predefined function called time. I will tell you what it does in just a second. For now, just add opening and closing brackets, and add dot .width at the end. Right away you will notice the null as well as our squares are positioned at the left end of the text layer. Which means that with the help of the source rect at time function we can simply call out the elements width at any given time within the composition. 
By the way, this also works with height, rotation and other properties. All in all, we are fairly close to what we are looking for. It seems like 230 is the correct gap, but as we want more distance between the squares and the text, we can simply boost up the number to something like 275 maybe? It looks good to me. If we now type some other text into the layer, we can see that it already works perfectly. But there is one issue with this particular animation. Because I set up the text layer with the character offset, and each character has a slightly different width, kerning and that stuff, the text layer's width does not stay the same throughout its animation. Which causes the null object to sort of jump back and forth, as it is constantly calculating its position depending on the text layer's width. So how do we fix that? Here is where the source rect at time function comes in really handy again. As the name already suggests, source rect at time considers all attributes at a specific time. Leaving the brackets empty will make it readjust each frame. But that also means that we can tell the function which frame it should look at, right? Toggling down the keyframes for the text layer, we are able to pinpoint when the character offset animation, which causes the width differences of the layer, is over. Over here we see that the last keyframe is at frame number 35. So all we need to do is add any number above 35 into the brackets as the corresponding frame number. Playing back again we will see that this fixed the problem. Okay, so with that done we only have to deal with the positioning of the notification bell. But let me speed this part up for you, as it basically is the same procedure as for the squares. We can even copy the expression of the square null to the new one for the bell and only change the gap value back to 230 and divide the width by 2 to position it right in the center of our text layer. As mentioned in other videos, it is a good habit to always name your layers. So let's do that for these nulls as well. Okay, great. So now we finally get to the actual template construction. With everything set up to be automatically adjustable and customizable, go into your Essential Graphics panel. If you can't see it, simply go to Window and activate the Essential Graphics panel here. So the first thing you need to do is selecting the composition you want the Motion Graphic Template to be based on. Then simply give it a name. Personally, I like to start with a custom prefix, which makes it easier to find later on. And follow that up with a descriptive name. This button will open up all the settings you can include in the template. And you'll notice it's basically everything there is. Well, maybe not everything, but an overwhelming amount for sure. So let's collapse that again. We only want specific things to be changed. Like for example, the main text layer. Simply open up the layer settings and choose source text. You can either right click and choose add property to essential graphics or simply drag it into the Essential Graphics panel. There are two basic parts of this panel. On the left side you have the description, so change this one from source text to something that actually tells you what it is, like main text. And the right part where you actually will be able to type the text. This will also work as the default value later in Premiere. Now let's assume you want to be able to change the text color. Going through the different settings, you will see no indicator for it. There just is no way to change the text color within the layer settings itself. And hence you cannot include it into the Essential Graphics panel, right? Well, not quite. What we can do is adding an effect called Tint. With this effect we have the ability to map everything that is pure black to one color, as well as doing the same thing with pure white. And this is why you should always base your templates on pure white or pure black colors. As you may have guessed, now we can right click the map to white section of the tint effect and add it to the panel. Change the description and you're ready to go. However, this only allows us to change the text color. What if we wanted to adjust all the other elements as well, but do not want to add the tint to all layers individually? I mean, that was really driving me nuts. So to solve that, let's add a new adjustment layer using the keyboard shortcut controller command plus Alt or Option and Y. Rename the layer and add the tint effect. Then we get down to the effect settings, add it to the panel and rename the description. Adjustment layers affect every layer that lies beneath it. But there are also a few elements we do not want to be affected by the tint effect, like our cursor image. As I said, adjustment layers affect everything that lies beneath them. 
which means to take whatever layer you don't want to be affected and drag it above it. So now whenever we change the tint, our cursor will stay in its original color. We want to be able to adjust as many elements as possible, but as few as necessary. This actually includes the second line of text, so we can have multiple instances of source text adjustments within the Essential Graphics panel. So naming them accordingly makes all the more sense. The more settings you include in the template, the more complex it gets. So After Effects included a neat way to organize the panel. Adding groups will enable you to, well, group elements. Also, if you need to include instructions on how to use parts of the template, you can simply add a comment to let other crew members, for example, know how to work with the settings they are given. The button Set Poster Time lets you bake the current frame as a preview for the template. This can come in handy, especially if you have multiple templates that are similar to each other. Finally, we can export the motion graphic template. After Effects will tell you to save the project, and then you can choose where to put the template file. I always keep a copy of my template files in a separate folder, so when I need to reinstall any of the programs, my templates will still be available. To be able to use the templates, for example in Premiere Pro, you have to save the template file to this path. Note that the app data folder is hidden, so you might need to enable hidden folders in your explorer by going to view and check hidden elements. After saving the file to its proper destination, you can open up Premiere Pro. With Premiere Pro opened up, you can either switch to the graphics tab or simply go to window and activate the essential graphics panel. In the top part of the panel, select My Templates and check Local Templates folder. Now you can see all pre-installed templates as well as your own. Simply type on the template you are looking for into the search field and drag it into your timeline. And here we have our new motion graphic template. Selecting it in the timeline will automatically bring you into the Edit tab, where you now can see all the setups you made previously inside of After Effects. Now you can play around with the settings and make it say and look however you want. And there you have it. You just created your very own motion graphic template. As with many things, you can get crazily creative with this. And the best thing is, it's another way to save shitloads of time in your process. Any questions? Drop them in the comments below and I'll get back to you to help you out. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and subscribe if you aren't already. Also, that bell is your friend, guys. Ring it to be notified about future videos. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!